Welcome to the Fright Zone. Uh, we have one. Let's do it. Look at the kind of awesome stuff they're giving us. You guys remember Ginger Snaps? Yeah. Like that's, that's like a modern day cult classic. It's scratch and scratch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas uh, and Hannah is how to pronounce your name. Uh, he is a filmmaker who has made the jump from short to web series, and he's really, I don't know, uh, how do I say, what's the word, Pro prolific with the series Hell's Kitty, if any of you have heard of it. And he has a talent for getting talent, which is uh, a talent to itself. So uh, Nicholas is moving into his, uh, they're finishing season one on Hell's Kitty. Uh, he just found out they may be getting Robert England, uh, who is interested in working with them uh, for the end of the season and maybe season two. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you. Cool. Next to Nicholas is Eric Solomon. Now, Eric is on the other side. He's the guy you want to know, or he's the guy you want to know how he thinks. Uh, he's the one who watches all of our films. He did uh, acquisitions at FearNet for years. And uh, if anyone are familiar with the short film initiative uh, that FearNet did the last couple years, uh, Eric was instrumental in, in selecting those films. So whereas a lot of us know what it's like to, you know, or have this, you know, outward, um, he's the one who's receiving. And so he knows a lot of what not to do because he's seen people do it. Um, I think it's a very interesting perspective to, to bring into a panel that's mostly filmmakers to have someone who is the guy the filmmakers are, are trying to get the attention of. So, uh, Rebecca, who I previously mentioned from Fangoria Magazine, uh, not only is she doing all her duties there, uh, but she's a filmmaker. And how, how many years now have you been uh, making films? Probably 10. 10 years. So, again, like only the last four I would actually show people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, Rebecca just completed a short film uh, which is entitled. Found, and that is playing next week, next month. I think it's at Fright Fest. I think that's next week. I wish I could go. It's in London. It's in London. Yeah. So, um, and that's I think something we should circle back and talk about is the importance of trying to get a overseas festival as well as festivals, you know, in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so Rebecca, she's also uh, I think the only person to uh, do last year's Holly Shorts panel and this year's. Um, everyone else was just too disgusted with me. By the <laughs> uh, so next uh, to Rebecca, we have uh, Kyle. Kyle is actually moved into making feature films. Uh, he is just putting the. Uh, uh, he's in post on a film called Night of the Living Deb, horror comedy, horror comedy, and uh, you know, I think one thing we'll want to talk about uh, with Kyle is that transition. You know. I think we all start out making shorts, and then, you know, the goal is hopefully to make something bigger and more commercial, and uh, here's a gentleman who's kind of navigated those waters, so we'll get hope <coughs> perspective there. And then last but not least, uh, Ryan, and Ryan is a uh, filmmaker who just, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Tribeca? Correct. Tribeca, his, his film just won. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. It just won by getting in. Uh, <laughs> humble too. Um, yeah, just my last horror short premiered there for the midnight section, mm -hmm. and they brought the midnight section back for the first time. Cool. And uh, the current project. So your your current project, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it is it moving into kind of a web series type format, or is it just an anthology film series? No. So whereas Kyle has made the transition from short to feature. I am trying to push the shorts into a feature by making a feature made up of shorts. Okay, so kind of anthology style. Or yeah, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> well, one of my favorite films, of course, is Creep Show. So that's been on your own. If you're making another Creep Show, you know, bless you, yeah. sir. So, uh, and the, his uh, current project is called the Mortuary Collection, and the first segment they shot is called Babysitter. Yep. And uh, we'll. Grab some insights on that as well. So, Talk about it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Theo Javon. I'm a Holly Schwartz co founder and co festival director. Um, Holly Schwartz is one of the biggest short form content festivals uh, in the world now, and it's definitely the biggest one in Los Angeles. And people come from all over the world to show their short films and short movies and meet industry professionals and 
uh, hopefully get signed and take their careers to the next level. Also network and meet the next generation of storytellers. So uh, it started off as a tiny um, uh, hole in the wall festival at the Space Theater in 2005. And year in, year out, we've had growth on submissions and attendance. And uh, really the fifth year is when it, it really started to explode when we had a big career in the Egyptian and uh, with the Cinematheque. And uh, we've had we've been at every kind of major venue, such as the Directors Guild of America, Egyptian, like I said, and uh, now we're our home uh, for this past couple of years has been the uh, Chinese Theater in Hollywood and the Roosevelt Hotel, where we uh, have our film conference. So the film conference, just like earlier today, some really engaging panels and um, discussions with uh, industry pros that have experience. And just talking about amazing um, opportunities for filmmakers. That's what that's why we created it. We wanted to create a think tank and a place where people can not only exhibit their works, but meet people that can help advance their projects to the next level, and uh, knowledge share. So that's what we're all about. Uh, so we'll start actually with you, Ryan. Uh, I think, just so people kind of get to know everybody, uh, what led you to making your first short? Like your very first short? Film school, I think. Um, I think there's like this ongoing debate whether or not film school is something that a filmmaker should do. I think it's dependent on the filmmaker. Some people have an amazing support system and they have their friends and they're making things in high school and they're making things in college. I was just drinking a bunch of beer in college and pretty much doing nothing else. <laughs> uh, and so film school sort of gave me a place, you know, I didn't get into film school for several years. I kept getting waitlisted again and again and again and so that sort of made me work in a cubicle and, uh, and find out what I didn't want to do. And right. then once I was in film school and I had the resources and the comrades uh, and sort of nothing to do but make films, I think that was what I really needed to sort of figure out that this was the path I needed to take. I think the next question for me on you is uh, for uh, uh, the new project. So what led to that? Like what was the catalyst of uh, the new project? Um, I, I made this film called Kirksdale. It was my thesis film in film school, and um, that film did really well for me, and I got an agent and a manager, and I sort of, uh, my plan had been to sort of do the Sam Raimi thing and be on the East Coast and make a movie and then come here, and that sort of fast-tracked all that. So I came here, and you know, within a month I'd been to like 65 meetings, and I was like at Sony and all these places where I shouldn't be uh, as a new filmmaker, and kind of got swept up in the Hollywood thing. And then I spent, everybody said that if I didn't have a feature I'd written, that I couldn't make a feature. So then I spent three years just writing, and then I wrote a feature that everyone loved, and again, they said, well, you haven't directed it, so you can't, you haven't directed a feature, so you can't direct this feature. And so I, it was sort of this like strange catch-22 that everybody knows about if you're here, but um, but it's a bummer when you experience it, because you think that you're going to be like the one that sort of bypasses it. Right. And uh, I sort of, you know, I wrote this, I was like, I love shorts. I mean, I, I genuinely love the short format, like not even as a stepping stone, but as like, I love short stories, I love short films, I love the medium. I think horror in particular lends itself to sort of this short format a lot of times. Uh, and so I was like, I'm gonna take all of my favorite shorts and combine them into a feature, just like Creepshow and the movies that sort of inspired me to be a filmmaker in the first place. Uh, I will always make features because I just think it's also a great way to test an idea so if anyone cares. Kind of a proof of concept thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, really it's sort of like it's a, it's great training too, right? Like if you're a, a you know a writer, you don't just start <coughs> out writing novels. You like write short stories for right. a while, and yeah, you like yeah. figure out figure it out, and you yeah. sort of move on. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've almost broken all my projects out now in short stories um, because it's just such a good launching pad uh, for your ideas. And yeah. I've actually uh, I do a little bit of comic book stuff, and I'm even breaking it down on that level now because the panel script for a comic book is basically like a storyboard for a writer, yeah. or I mean, yeah, it's like a story, you know, so um, that too, oh, Hell's Kitty in the comic book, that's a perfect segue, <laughs> um, talk about marketing, uh, there you go, I don't have to talk about that, uh, hold that tight, Rebecca, uh, you are, from what I uh, actually just recently heard, also kind of in this development tennis match where you're the ball back and forth, yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I've um, I've been shooting shorts for a while now, and a couple of them have got a lot of recognition and got me a lot of meetings. 
got me an agent who still doesn't return my calls and things like that. And, um, you know, so after a while, I started getting people asking me about features and I started getting meetings. And I've now discovered that just because somebody says, oh, I want you to direct my feature, it doesn't mean anything. So um, I've now signed three contracts, two of which fell apart in pre-production, and I was giving a parting gift that may have paid my electric bill for a month and then sent on my way, mm -hmm. and that was it. And so, um, yeah, it, it's now become kind of um, exactly what you said, where people are like, well, show me what you've made, but you haven't made anything yet. Um, because even though, you know, I've been doing these shorts for a long time, because I want to go to this next level, I've got people asking me, well, where's your feature? And, no one's paid me to make one yet, so um, yeah, I've still got one contract pending, supposedly we're going to be up in November, ready to go, so um, we'll see, fingers well, crossed. And I think the important thing, uh, maybe, to take away from, from Rebecca, though, is that she's not stopped making shorts, oh, and God, those are no. still getting out there, mm -mm, uh, no. so yeah. We're like, actually shooting another one next weekend. Um, I want to make, I mean, this for me is like, it even, don't tell anybody this, but even if no one would pay me, mm -hmm. I'd still keep doing it probably. Um, just as a passion, I mean, I've been doing shorts for so long with no one paying me. So, um, you know, even if tomorrow it was like, you're never going to get a feature, I'd probably still be doing this. And we're shooting another one next week. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so valuable to make use of that time when you're waiting for people to say yes or no. Like, you can't, you can uh, have one baby and just depend on it. You have to, you know, it's like if you're in the boat, you throw out all your fishing lines, and if one, you know, you, you just let them, the lure go, and you work on another one while you're waiting for it to nibble on one. And, um, that's how you have a body of work, and that's how you have proof, you know, that you can make stuff. So, that's true. And if you go, if you, I mean, if you go to a meeting and you're like, in your, in your brain, you're like, oh man, this is going to be, this is going to be my break, I need this. <clears throat> They sense it, but if you go in a meeting and you're like, I gotta get out of here, I got the location that's got this thing I'm making in like five minutes, they feel that too. And they're yeah. they like people like that. They're like, Oh, this guy's like or this girl, they're like constantly making things. This is someone else this is a, a wagon that wanna hit hitch my yeah. your wagon. Hitch my wagon. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was one of the best <laughs> advice I'd ever been given by somebody and it was by a, a major horror filmmaker. We're increasingly living in a generation with much distraction. And we don't want to put 10,000 hours to get anything done right. But if you don't put, like they say, 10,000 hours into something, you don't get good at it. Mm -hmm. And so it's too expensive to do features and make mistakes. Really. Right. So shorts are a great way to make that mistake. And then more recently, um, new media is just an incredible avenue. And so I, I really have no interest in shorts beyond doing them for new media, which being like shorts related to a series or something, only because for me, that could become something else, and I, I, I believe in reskinning is the term in the gaming industry. You know, when you build something, let's see if you can market it in a billion different ways. You know, because you're putting effort and time into it. So I have like 19 shorts that I did that becomes a season of this web series that I do. They're all very high quality, um, and I'm going to piece them all together and have my feature really soon, in about two months, and it will be the cheapest feature ever made with the amount of stars I have in it, probably in horror history, if we can put this together and make it work. And um, and that's kind of like my angle on it. Reskin it so it's a feature. It's a comic book. Um, it's shorts. It's and bring it out for all your hours of effort. And and I can say there's going to be parts where we recut out scenes and re-edit because we've right. learned along the journey. We've been right. doing this for three years. So you get good at something when you do it once a month, and you keep doing it and doing it, and you just get better at it and learning how to do it. Um, so that's kind of my long answer how I got the bug. Yeah. Well, I think. I think you're, and I'm in complete agreement with you on, uh, you know, the the next evolution of short film is, you know, serializing it or, or you know, uh, making it into your own anthology. Uh, I think that um, you, you make those first three or four shitty ones, right? You know, just make them because you love it, because you got to learn off of it, and then as you get more serious, you know, let the let the little marketing guy in your head think about ways to to theme them and, and package them. Uh, so you can make better use of them. <laughs> uh, it, it is, I mean, when you do, you learn. And the other thing about it is work begets work. Right. You were kind of touching upon that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gotten, because of doing this, even though I haven't made any money off this, and that's partly by choice, uh, we actually donate any money we make off the merchandising to nonprofit partners that help animals. And that way, no one's getting mad. You know, like for now, it's just we're building a brand. Because I believe the real money right now is if we start selling it as a TV show concept or and things like that. And I just want to build the brand um, so that everyone knows of Hell's Kitty. And it's really worked. We've had major management in town 
contact us and say, at first we're like kind of begging people to be in the show, but then I was proven ourselves. Now everyone's like, it's the thing. Like, you haven't been in this, you were in this, and I wasn't in this. So now we have all these horror people like calling us saying, I want to be in Hell's Kitty, find a role for me and stuff. And it's, I mean, Robert Englund was the most recent one. So if you guys don't know his name, he was Freddy Krueger. So it's pretty big, you know, to have these guys call and be like, hey, I want to be in Hell's Kitty. So, um, so that's, you know, that's how it grows. It's like the snowball effect. So that's the other thing is, you know, you may not be making money on the one thing you're doing, but it's a big resume calling card. Yeah. And it's constantly putting your name out there and you're as relevant as what you're doing in the moment. Right. You know, I mean, there's tons of talent that are doing stuff because they don't have anything they've done recently. Right. They just want to stay relevant, you know, and if you, and it's so quick that you can be not relevant in yeah. today's world. It's true. I actually uh, really, uh, had the benefit of that myself. And my, uh, I have a film playing this weekend, and uh, we got a really good actor for it because of that. Because he wanted to stay relevant. He had, you know, he liked the script. That helps. Um, but he was like, yeah, he's like, you know what? Um, let's do it. And it, I think most smart working actors do work that way. They're like, if I can be on screen, I'm going to be on screen as long as people are not wasting my time. And we used the film that had played at this festival last year to show him. And he's like, that's oh, pretty good. Okay, I'll do it. And we were able to get the kind of talent that uh, two years before I never thought I would have had the ability to get. Um, totally. I think, you know, saying work be uh, begets work, I mean, that just hits almost the nail on the head for what this panel should be about. My very first short that I ever did um, was God Offer. It was awful. Um, way over ambitious. It was a um, rockabilly strip club telling of Hawthorne's feather top, if you've ever read that. <laughs> it's also a musical. Um, it was 40 minutes long. People didn't respond to it? No. I think Ryan's needed actually. Yeah. yeah, he came to I had to do this like mad presentation for my PhD, and I had to show everything I've ever made from start to finish until so Ryan saw it. Um, but it's awful. It's freaking terrible. But the it's one... That bad. Um, <laughs> we're going to see it at the panel next week. <laughs> it's probably the best lesson I've ever learned, which is if you hire one person and spend a lot of money on them, make it your audio guy. Um, right. Because we were using on-camera mics. The first lesson oh. I learned as a filmmaker is never do that. So, um, but anyways, um, the thing that I did like doing and think that we did well in that short was the gore. And just from that one short, I got a call from um, the band Municipal Waste, who asked me to direct some of their four sequences in one of their upcoming videos. And then from that, I got work with Guar. And then from there, I went to Lamb of God. So, like, straight out the gate, even though that short sucked, just because of the murder set pieces I put in it, it got me work straight out. So um, it went nicely because of that. And anyone that worked on that with you can use that as a resume, too, to continue to do that kind of work. Yep. And most of them have stuck with me, like most of my team, which is also nice. If you know people who are making shorts, help them out because then when they make it, oh, yeah. they'll take you along with them. Because like the DP that I still use, I've been using for three years. And I mean, he's now shooting the Flash TV show, but he still comes and helps me because we've been working together for so long. So, you know, you'd be surprised the people you can get to come in for a day, you know, to help you out and do something. But you have to micro break down and know how to produce so you're not asking so much of people, mm -hmm. especially if it's free. Um, but then it's cool, then your network's massive. Like the people that worked on Hell's Kitty, like if they even get one person to come to a screening each, we're gonna have an army of yeah, people, right. you know? Yeah. So it's massive the amount of network that you've expanded out your 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 sort, you know, your brand. So it's, it works on many levels. And we fold a lot of people in and out of our crews when we're working, but um, yeah, it's and it's nice because then it forms kind of this community amongst filmmakers. So like if one of my friends is shooting something and they'll call me up and be like, I need an audio guy. I'll have six that I know are really top notch that I can give them. And you know, and it's just great to work with people. I mean, you ain't need my last short. So yeah. So yeah. And, and the filmmaking community is small. The horror filmmaking community is much smaller. Mm -hmm. So that's actually if you're smart, a very good thing. And if you're not smart, a very bad thing. So, you know, uh, You've got to be really good to people, and you, it's, it is a community. And uh, you know, when you help people out, they help you out. Mm -hmm. uh, I one of my favorite marketing terms: uh, a rising tide raises all ships. I think that applies to every all the community as well as for creative. I'm going to jump to uh, back to the short and ask. I'm going to come back down. Oh, start with Ryan. Two two pieces of, of advice I want to get from everybody for the audience. Uh, what is, in your opinion? the best thing you can do uh, to help promote your film when it's at a screening, 
Uh, and then what for you is the best thing uh, if it's online? And I'm going to ask that from everybody. Um, and, and also if there's something you tried and failed miserably. Um, the best thing you can do to promote your film? Yeah, say, say you get into Tribeca. Uh, what do you do? It's tough because there's the, all this like standard rigmarole that you do with a feature that I don't really think is necessary for a short. I don't think it's. I don't know. I mean, I, I've done I've done posters and uh, websites and flyers, and um, I, I haven't really seen a benefit. The biggest thing that I ever did on my last film was cut a really cool trailer, because you don't want to put the film online because yeah because you're playing at major festivals, but at the same time you want people to get a sense and a flavor of what you've done. I think that um, a really great trailer um, that's like less than a minute long for a short, yeah. Yeah. I think is um, absolutely vital. I don't think I would ever do. I think that's without a doubt above and beyond the most important yeah. thing as far as the marketing goes. And, and I've actually been to festival. I mean, at Tribeca this year, I had posters and stuff, and they wouldn't even let me hang. Right. Like, there wasn't even a place to hang posters. So yeah. I just had this tube, and I was walking around with the tube like a nerd. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a backpack with a computer, and it just, yeah. yeah. Everyone liked like that. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, to be honest, I would say if you have a short year at a festival, the thing to do is not to worry so much about marketing. This is just my opinion, but it's more just meet and communicate to meet yeah. the yeah, right, makers. I agree. I agree. Uh, that's totally yeah. yeah. Because oh. you're talking, sorry, yeah. but you're yeah. talking about um, just what you guys are talking about and having a network. Like for you guys who are in film school, it's amazing in film school because you have this whole crew that you can pick from. But once you get out of film school that crew diminishes significantly. Every year, people get more and more jobs. And you can't, like, the, what's weird about filmmaking is, is you can't do it alone. Uh, I think, too, uh, next year, instead of having a discussion, we should all bring our crappy short films. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll have, like, a little mini viewing for all of you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs>